Well, I'm here today with Janice and Jim Prochaska. It's 7 December here in Australia and uh, 6 December in Mill Valley. Yes. And we're, uh, I'm excited for the chance to find out who you are and why. The world knows a lot about what you do. And uh, <clears throat> my interest in this series is to get to the nitty gritty of what led you to uh, do the wonderful work you've done. And uh, I'd like to start with your, your roots. And uh, since I've got two of you together, we're real bonus. Uh, you can take turns, whoever wants to go first, flip a coin or, um, how did you okay. happen to get into this field? Oh, oh, I thought you were talking about further back in the heritage. Uh, for myself, in terms of getting into the field, um, I, in college, I was majoring in uh, sociology, uh, but my father had serious uh, mental health problems, uh, uh, manic depressive, and uh, it, it was, there were times where he was really good, and there were other times when he was really bad, and, and it, uh, it turned out we were not able to get the kind of help that he might have gotten today. And in my junior year, he ended up taking his life, and that led me to uh, say, I need to become a clinical psychologist because I felt helpless uh, almost all of the times in which he was in a bad place and demons had taken over. And so uh, that led me into uh, psychology. And then later we can talk more about going from uh, clinical uh, psychology more to uh, health psychology. And yeah, also I, I, I actually do mean to, it as early memories, um, you know, from birth or even <laughs> previous lifetimes, if you want. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's also, a major factor for sure. Yeah, in my you... junior year of college, um, I also had the opportunity to be um, volunteering at a, a place called the Franklin Settlement House. And I was fascinated how under one roof, so many services could be given to people in the neighborhood, from daycare to GEDs to learning the English language and cooking. And there was a wonderful social worker who was leading the organization, and she just really inspired me to go into the field of social work. Where was that, and, and where did you go to college? We both were graduated from Wayne State University in Detroit. We're originally from Michigan. We fell in love making eyes across the band room at Fordson High School in Dearborn, Michigan. Ah. Uh, and how old were you then? I was 14. And uh, I was uh, going on 18. So I couldn't ask her out then because that would have been seen as uh, cradle snatching. Cradle snatcher, so, yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so how long did you have to wait? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, I had dropped out of college. I was going to go hitchhiking around the country and working with migrant workers and all. And uh, I took my sister bowling on a Saturday night. Janice walked in on that uh, Saturday night and I fell back in love with her again. Now she was old enough. And so uh, 16. I had to get up the courage to call her and I did. <laughs> what a great story. And did you go on this road trip then or not? I did, yeah. But... Uh, I, I was actually inspired by Eric Erickson, where I really wanted to get a deeper sense of myself, you know, the stage of identity, but also a deeper understanding of my society. And after being on the road for nine months, I decided I wanted to move on to Erickson's next stage of intimacy and be back in Michigan with Janice. So I hitchhiked back. Following the formula, good. <laughs> <laughs> So, Janice, what, what uh, earlier experiences did you have, like, uh, growing up, and were there any motivations to uh, go into your work? Uh, more that experience in the settlement house, but growing up, uh, it was a working class neighborhood, and very important in the family to be uh, physically active in sports, and as well as getting good grades. So that was just a real mantra in the home to, to do both and to do both well. Uh -huh. For myself, uh, early on, in part, very much actually connected with my father's uh, 
uh, demons and problems. Uh, I grew up as a free range kid. Um, at age six, I was the only one that was able to stay at the boys club until nine o'clock and I would walk the nine blocks back home. Uh, free to play all summer, uh, loved play because of imagination. Uh, and later, I, I really decided I wanted to understand what personal freedom was about and how we could use that to uh, help ourselves and others to get healthier. Oh, and play is so important and so under under um, utilized now with the controlled play that isn't really play. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, we, we would play uh, softball on the cement streets, having all the kids, girls, the younger, all ages, no umpires. We, you know, we took care of that ourselves uh, yeah. and, and uh, you know, just free to use our imaginations and have fun and... Uh, and, and parents who were not helicopters, you know, they were trusting us. Yeah. Well, um, a little more about your, your uh, early uh, courtship and, and how you, uh, also your relationship that you've been together, how many years? Uh, 53. Well, that's married in five years before that. Uh-huh. And mm -hmm. you have how many kids? Two. And, and five grandkids. grandkids. How many? Five. Five. And uh, I know you moved to, to Mill Valley to be closer to some of them. Yes, there's three in, sorry, two in Mill Valley and three at Santa Cruz, so we can easily see all five grandkids. Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that was commendable all the way from uh, Rhode Island to good old Mill Valley that I know so well. So we where my see granddaughters another... live. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, we went by your your beautiful setting where you were established a wellness center and, uh, and, and you walk into this uh, grove, uh, a family of redwoods and just immediately feel at peace and connected with nature and beauty. Yeah. And we live now amongst a family of redwoods and looking out over Mount Tam and all and just feel you know, so connected to uh, nature. Yeah, Mill Valley is so special, isn't it? Uh, just, yeah, just yeah. if the weather were warmer for me, Mill <laughs> <laughs> Valley is what my friends call it. Uh, well, it's a lot warmer than uh, Rhode Island at this time of the year. Oh, this time of year for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's been raining every day, which is a good thing. I've heard. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. Uh, had a little rain last week, but it didn't slow the fires any. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, in addition to your professional work, your personal work, that you are still such a great couple through uh, surviving having children, which has been my work uh, from personal as well as professional interests that in a culture where nuclear families attempt to replace the village, how hard it is. And I, I'm curious what uh, support you had when your kids were little, was that uh, a factor at all? Uh, well, I worked in a family service agency, and it was great to have family daycare available for the work days that I had, as well as a daycare center when the kids got older and after school care. So there was good support from the agency that I was actually working in. Uh-huh. Any other relatives in the area or uh, support from... No, no, but relatives and friends would come and see us. We would go back to Michigan uh, at holidays and all. And then developing uh, friendships, uh, you know, within the community, mostly first coming from work, but then uh, as we were involved in like coaching uh, youth sports, we got to know a lot more people that way and developed uh -huh. the support system there. But I'll say this, and Janice, uh, you know, we both experienced it. We found Mill Valley much more uh, warm and welcoming than uh, New England. Uh, New England, yeah. you know. If you haven't lived there for centuries, you know, you're a newcomer. <laughs> exactly. My four years in med school was enough to get me out of there fast. <laughs> and I went straight from Boston to Mill Valley. Oh. Why did well, I we spent who? 46 years in Rhode Island, so we were there for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. almost natives. <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, a couple more Jen, generations. Jen, uh, insists we deliver both children in Newport because if you weren't born in Newport, you could never be a Newporter. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
your kids got wise and moved to California before you, that, I guess. Well, once both uh, kids went to graduate school at UC San Diego, and once your children see California, you can't get them back. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But also, there's just much more opportunities in California. Yeah. And they, they took advantage of that. Yes. Well, I first encountered your work, Jim, back in the 90s, I think, through uh, my colleague Bobby uh, Salzer, who was uh, uh, developing the coaching program for the wellness inventory. And they were using your work. And then Mike Arlowski picked it up, too. And mm -hmm. I, I remember, um, I didn't know where, uh, I was spending a lot of time around the DC area and, and uh, I tracked down De Clemente. I actually mm -hmm. talked to him on the phone uh, when I was going through Baltimore. We were almost got together for lunch, but uh, I'm curious uh, how you and he got hooked up originally and, and what are some of the uh, origins of what led to your famous work? Well, uh, a couple of shared uh, histories. Uh, Carlo was a priest and he was sent to Rome to get groomed to become a bishop. Uh, oh. I started off in uh, Presbyterian College on a Presbyterian scholarship to become a Presbyterian minister. Uh, but we both decided to become secular clergy rather than uh, uh, religious clergy. Um, and they're and still both preaching. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and, and I was very fortunate that he decided to uh, get, come to uh, Rhode Island, University of Rhode Island, to be a, a PhD student, and I was his major professor. And, and oh. uh, well, my model is to have uh, my students become collaborators as fast as they're ready. And he was, uh, he's been a, a great collaborator. And he also was a student at the Family Service Agency that I worked at, so that we had both advantages wow. of getting connected to him. Yeah. And when you first published, how, what was the acceptance and how, uh, how did that go? Well, um, the, the good, uh, fortunate thing is we were able to uh, publish one of our first articles in American Psychologist which is the most widely cited and most important journal in psychology. Uh, and, and so it, it was picked up uh, right away. Just as an example, out of 10,000 uh, studies on uh, tobacco, our uh, article, American Psychologist, was the number one most cited uh, of all 10,000 articles. So it really uh, had an important impact. But then, uh, Bill Miller, who was developing motivational interviewing at the same time, mm -hmm. uh, he sent me a copy of his uh, work, and I said, that's brilliant. I sent him a copy of mine, he said, that was brilliant. And so he set up one of the international conferences on the addictions in England, and it was based on the trans theoretical model. So he got us a global uh, recognition much faster than we would have uh, otherwise. Ah being in the right place at the right time, knowing the right people. Yes. 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 <laughs> now, how did you cook up the name Trans Theoretical? It's quite a mouthful and so many people have <laughs> opted with the, the six stages. Well, yeah, and it's often called the stages of change model. Uh, what I was originally setting out to do, again, becoming a uh, clinical psychologist, I was uh, struck with the reoccurring knowledge that very diverse therapies produce very common outcomes. And I said, well, there must be things that they're doing that uh, they have in common. And so I had uh, my graduate seminar go in and analyze the leading uh, 25 theories of psychotherapy. And they actually found out that therapies had much more to say about why people don't change, such as personality and psychopathology, rather than how people can change, which became the processes of change. And so from Freud, we took consciousness raising, from Skinner, we took the reinforcement management, from uh, uh, Carl Rogers, we took the uh, 
therapeutic relationship. And so we, when we discovered stages of change, we immediately saw that, hey, this is the uh, missing link. This allows us to integrate processes from very different theories into an integrative model. Hence the title trans-theoretical, integrating across different theories. I see, finally. I wondered. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when we were presenting in England, what, one of the uh, uh, commenters uh, you know, with their humor he said, you know, I think we should call this the transgalactic model. <laughs> <laughs> and now what years was this? Uh, 79 was when we published uh, the American Psychology, no, actually 81, and uh, the England uh, conference was a couple of years after that. Interesting. Of course, 81 is when I published my wellness workbook. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. And, uh, now, Janice, you were uh, more in the background in those days, uh, I'm, but I'm guessing uh, only because of visibility, not because of activity. Uh, where I got connected more to the TTM was that uh, in uh, 1992, I went back to work on my PhD in social work. Uh, realizing that both of the kids were on the track to get PhDs, I figured I had to keep up with the family. <laughs> and I, right off, I, I knew I wanted to apply the model to organizational change. And so that really gave the focus to my part-time PhD program at uh, Boston College. And then once I was near completion of the degree, that's when um, we together started uh, ProChange Behavior Systems, which really took the model and made it into more of a commercial opportunity for health companies and insurance companies to license the work that we were creating and to put it into the real world. So I'm much more the practical, let's get things done in a different way to, to have more and more people use the model uh -huh. in the correct way. So Janice had a, a staff of about 20 people, uh, seven PhDs, all women, and uh, they just did the terrific work uh, and really complemented what we were doing at the Cancer Prevention Research Center with uh, like the small business innovation grants and with uh, contracts from uh, companies. And so it really was a, a good partnership between academia and a small business with a shared mission. I mean, we always had to share the mission to enhance the health of as many people as possible. And after about 20 years, we sold the company. It still does exist. Uh, and there are several staff who are continuing with developing new programs based on the model. It's amazing that you both uh, work together and have kids together and are still together. <laughs> uh, and uh, your, your complementary skill set. And, and I know, Jim, uh, from your um, being one of the few people that uh, brags about not having a, a cell phone, uh, your your life. No, it's, it's just I call it a dumb phone because it oh. got lost. It got lost three times. <laughs> well, I I know that you're uh, uh, much more for the face to face than the uh, virtual connections, and I'm appreciative that you were willing to to uh, deign to record this. <laughs> Well, I, I sent my first email when I was 73 years old to uh, my uh, seven-year-old granddaughter and five-year-old grandson, and they emailed back, good going, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you text? That's the next step. Uh, I email. I don't, uh, I don't text. Uh, yeah, me too. I, I find texting very annoying. <laughs> You know, we were the first within the Cancer Prevention Research Center, and I was a, a leader to say, hey, we can take this work that we're doing and deliver it with digital technology, and that way we could reach many more people at much lower cost. And I did all that not knowing how to work a computer. So. <laughs> the big picture guy. Yeah. 
Yeah, with great staff, as Janet's saying. I mean, all of what we did, you know, we could only do it with really great collaborators, you know, like Carlo, for example, and like the uh, two uh, women PhDs who uh, took over leadership of the company. Yeah, well, it's commendable. And uh, what uh, I know that uh, from our, um, my meeting you through the Unitarian Church there in Marin, uh, that you have uh, spiritual sides to you, and uh, as well as the intellectual, that the uh, discussion group that we're part of is uh, very intellectually and spiritually uplifting. How do you see the, the spiritual component fitting into your work and your lives? Well, uh, you know, psyche uh, for psychology, it has a couple of meanings. One is uh, the mind, the other is the soul. And uh, I am a most, much more uh, spiritual in terms of really experiencing the mind is uh, frankly our most uh, sacred gift and, uh, and really uh, cherishing my mind. And when I go into my mind, I feel like at times I'm in a cathedral other times I feel like I'm in a library or a laboratory, and other times I feel like I'm in a mental hospital, totally <laughs> confused. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I personally reached out to the Unitarian Church um, in Marin because of wanting to have community moving to a new area, also knowing about Unitarianism from having been uh, lifelong members at Star Island, which is owned by the Unitarian Church, and it's an island off of Portsmouth, New Hampshire. We have been going as a family since 1975. Six. Oh, so really? And, and, and it was also interesting, too, like, grew up in Dearborn, very Catholic, very Italian, Polish, and never even heard of Unitarianism until I moved to Rhode Island, and in my family service agency, it was housed in the home that William Ellery Channing was born in, who's the founder of Unitarianism. Wow. So there was all kinds of neat connections. But um, I don't feel that spiritual at all. Um, my grandson, who's now 11, said, wow, Nanny, you're an atheist, and you're the vice president of your church. <laughs> so he thinks that's pretty cool, and I do too. Well, I, as a... When I heard, I, I got uh, and became a member of the Harvard Square Unitarian Church when I was in med school because I found oh, medical you. school uh, such an exercise in intellectual deprivation. And they, <laughs> they even told us. Uh, I remember a professor saying, You know, you're basically in a <clears throat> high level meat cutting school. <laughs> you're, you're learning a vocabulary, basically, of all these concepts. But there isn't much intellectual to it, and that was true. So once a week, I'd journey over on the red line to uh, Harvard Square, and then uh, when my when I got married, middle late through second year, we uh, she joined as well and had her first art exhibit there in the uh, We've church. Been in that yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've gone to uh, services there. What What I've heard is that it's a church for agnostics. Uh, I, I, I'm a pantheistic pagan agnostic myself, figuring that'll mm. cover all the bases. But uh. <laughs> yeah, I see. I see. To me, the biggest threats are dogma. You know, dogma on the left, dogma on the right, religious yeah. dogma, secular dogma, and that's certainly one of the things that Unitarianism is not. <laughs> exactly. But you also can have dogmatic psychologists who. Uh, this is the only true theory or, you know, whatever. The one true way, yeah. Yeah. Well, what uh, do you see the future for yourselves in the field? Well, um, frankly, uh, we, we, some of the things that we are doing is to really uh, keep moving the model towards population health. Uh, and one of the things that I'm working on with one of my uh, brilliant uh, PhD students is uh, looking at uh, uh, health uh, from multiple level perspective, from the cell, the self, and society, and looking at how each one of these levels uh, can really interact uh, to help 
uh, in terms of prevent diseases, to heal diseases. Um, and so uh, th that's one of the areas. And our goal is to have the six span be equal to the, I mean, the health span be equal to the lifespan. So yeah. like the blue zones in the world, where people live long and healthy, and they die in the, in the last few months with uh, just dying of old age, but high quality of life basically equal to their uh, lifespan. And the sense of meaning and purpose is so crucial to that. And it's so yes. difficult in a shame-based culture to, to know what your meaning and purpose is, as you two have clearly exhibited as role models of that in, in your work. Yeah, no, on a practical level, one of our colleagues who has used the model in his company probably now for over 20 years is talking with us about establishing a training institute so that it would be hopefully international so people would fly in and learn the model and which is really important to me to be able to use it and take it back home to where they are working and, and, and doing research. So this is something that I hope would happen in the next one to two years and would really help the model get established is, is a real great training institute. And, and Janice decided she wasn't retiring, she's repurposing. And I'd uh -huh. say she's, re she's repurposing with a vengeance. I mean, she is doing so many good things. So. And I'm, the, I'm not going to retire. I'm going to be on permanent sabbatical as of July 1. <laughs> Next year. Jim, Jim ends his 50 years at URI, June 30th no. of 2020. Congratulations. And I, I wanted to say, I, I was touched a few minutes ago with your description of your mind as a sacred space because it's so often denigrated by the uh, um, spiritual uh, um, versus mind folks as, uh, you know, they, the parts of the mind that are, that can drive us nuts, but there's so much more and the, uh, the layering <clears throat> of the different aspects. Uh, just yesterday, I was um, listening to the author, I can't pronounce his name, of that book that we, we talked about a few weeks ago on uh, mm. Origins of Consciousness. Uh, do yes. you know who I mean? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and his description <clears throat> of these different layers of the mind that are, are coming together, which sounds a little bit trans-theoretical itself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, well, but you, yeah, you, but you know, it's it, it, psychology. Uh, when Skinner took over, you know, we said psychology lost its mind, you know, and uh, <laughs> and the mind's been uh, replaced with the brain. And I look at the brain as the hardware and the mind as the software, and mm -hmm. clearly the software is much more important than the uh, hardware. And I also look at the brain as a great differentiator, whereas I see the mind as a great integrator where it can pull the fragmentation that we have in psychology and health and higher education, pull those back together in, in a meaningful way. Uh, are you familiar with Carl Prebrem's uh, image of the brain as a holographic projector and a, uh, yeah. uh, more like a TV set? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's intrigued me. He and, uh, and David Bohm's uh, uh, um, implicit versus explicit, which seem to be related to the hardware and the software. You've got to have them both. You know, mm, software yes. without the hardware can't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. And without the software, the brain's just a hunk of a flesh. So who knows what this mystery of life is about, but uh, it's, it's fun exploring it. And uh, I'm delighted oh, sure. to... I mean, one thing that I value with Unitarianism is, you know, it, it takes the big picture, you know, it's uh, Unitarianism and Universalism, and our son's an astrophysicist, and he, uh, he helps us, you know, to really appreciate the universe and the multiple universes. So. Jim forgot to turn on the phone.
<laughs> I forgot to too, and, and mine will actually interrupt the Zoom call. It happened the other day. Oh, wow. So now that, now, now that he's away, Janice, anything you want to <laughs> He's right <Jeremy's>. here. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. So, I, I told you I had a dumb phone, not a smart phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I call mine a stupid phone uh, because it's not dumb. It still talks, but <laughs> it's not very smart. Though I did give up flip phones to go to an iPhone uh, last year be because I could use it for navigation. <laughs> but, yes, um, very important. The, um, uh, I'm just uh, so touched to have this opportunity to share both of you with uh, our viewers, listeners, and whatever future this uh, project has to uh, collect yeah. together the, the wisdom of uh, pioneers in so many different fields. So, um, you know, we were wondering if you were like uh, creating an oral history and a video history. You know? That's exactly, that's the name yeah. of the project, an oral history of wellness. Uh, Sure. Although what happened was after I collected all the wellness folks that I was working with, I realized there was this whole constellation of people around uh, different uh, sides who were in influencing me from, you know, it was called holistic health and then all complementary yeah. alternative mm -hmm. and yes. Uh, yes. functional medicine. And then I really think the positive psychology movement it's more about wellness than what's called wellness nowadays. The word got mm -hmm. uh, co-opted by the treatment model. And so it's expanded to be a much bigger constellation of uh, people. And then stumbling on the two of you a couple of years ago, <laughs> right <laughs> under my nose, it was like, wow. So I, I felt very blessed to uh, have encountered so many wonderful people along the way and to uh, and to build a, a, a virtual community of them uh, in many different ways. So any parting words before we wrap up? Well, I would hope that people would check out our book, Changing to Thrive, because oh, yes. it really, really um, puts forth in a clear way how to help people through the stages of change through five different health risk behaviors. Yeah, and it really updated Changing uh, for Good. Changing for Good had a, a really huge impact but uh, Changing for Thrive really brings it to uh, much more in terms of where we're at with, and we emphasize all you know, the breakthroughs that have happened in the uh, more than 20 years that Changing for Good was uh, published. But I also wanna say, I think what you're doing is, is, is a really an integrative thing, that is bringing uh, together people with a common spirit, but different perspectives. Yeah, it's uh, cross-fertilization is so important. Uh, yeah. What you said about uh, the five health risks r reminded me that my earliest mentor was Louis Robbins in the health, as he called it, health hazard appraisal back in the days when they were doing mm -hmm. desk calculators. Yes. Yeah, yes. Interesting. Did you know him? Were you? Uh, uh, no, I knew of him, but not personally. Yeah, he uh, um, inspired me early on. That was my thesis for my um, Masters in Public Health at Hopkins. Mm -hmm. We computerized it, and then we discovered it was great for scaring people, but it didn't change behavior. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, ProChange developed an alternative called a health risk intervention, and so that uh, it would immediately assess what stage people were in and give them feedback, uh -huh. uh, you know, how might they might start to progress. Because you know, assessments without uh, Help, it can scare or it can uh, it's not go anywhere. So uh, yeah, that yeah. was a nice innovation. Another parallel, I, I developed a wellness inventory to try to get to the underlying stuff. So our yes. paths were certainly parallel there for many yes. decades. And in fact, you know, I was at a Presbyterian school not far from yours at <laughs> first year. Wow. Well, which one was that? Uh, Worcester. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. We played Kenyan, football right? against Worcester. No, I was at uh, Muskingum. Muskingum, yeah. We, we uh, go there for football games, I remember. And uh -huh. so, uh, all these parallels. And plus, I grew up uh, listening to uh, CKLW in uh, Windsor. <laughs> <laughs> it had a broad range, that's for sure. Yes. 
Well, thank you both so much. I'm inspired. Yeah, thank you for getting us to do this. Yeah, it's so good being with you and, and uh, having an opportunity to share with many others in terms of uh, what we've been sharing together. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording now. Okay, so...